Garrett from Earth and Time, and today I'm at Capitol Reef National Park. Let's go take a look. I have arrived at the visitor center for Capitol Reef National Park, and what I want to show you all is some of the spectacular scenery and talk about some of the geology that is behind me. So the geologic units that we see here are mostly run through the Triassic and the Jurassic, which was the early time of the dinosaurs to the classic Jurassic, right? We all know Jurassic Park, the Jurassic, which is the central time or the main time of the dinosaurs. Eventually there's the Cretaceous and that's when they went extinct. What we can see behind me at the lowest levels back here is known as the Moenkopi. Above that, the colorful green that we see there is known as the Chin Li. And the Chin Li formation is famous because that's what makes up Petrified Forest National Park as well. So this was a swampy environment. Dinosaurs were roaming around in these things during that time. And it gives it this very colorful appearance. Above that, you're going to go into what is known as the Wingate. And that's the big, thick sandstone we see here within the park. And we'll see that in numerous places as we start touring here. Above that, there's a little bit of a... Uh, before you get to the white topped sandstone, just below that, it's known as the Canto Formation. And the white topped sandstone that you can see, the very, very top up there is known as the Navajo Sandstone. And that's also what makes up Zion National Park, which is very famous. Most people are familiar with it from there. So that's a little bit about the stratigraphy. Let's go ahead and head into the Capitol Reef Visitor Center. I like this, the stories rocks tell us. So as a geologist, I always think of myself as a combination of Sherlock Holmes and as a storyteller, because I'm always trying to put together what actually happened here and how do I explain that to others? Hence, I make these videos. Here's a display of some of the rocks and you can actually come up and touch them. So here's the Chin Li Formation, which we talked about, which was the very colorful and variegated uh, slope formers that we saw. Then the Wingate Sandstone, which are the big cliffs that make up most of Capitol Reef National Park and you can actually come in here and feel what these different types of material feel like. They have what's known as a Dakota sandstone so this would be during the time of the Cretaceous but we aren't going to see that. I don't I don't think we're going to see this today but what we will see are some of these black boulders. So there's a series of these rounded black boulders that were from volcanics that happened about 25 million years ago and then through a series of debris flows probably related to glaciation they got rounded and carried into the park and throughout this area and we'll see some of these basaltic what they call black boulders here so as far as geology goes i think this visitor center has outdone itself it shows geological layers and if you remember we talked about the idea of of superposition the oldest layers are going to be at the bottom with the youngest on top just like if you're going to make a cake right you put the bottom layer here and then you build up from there but what they have is they talk about some of the other things happening here like uplift so we're in an area where what was known as a laramide orogeny took place it was this major mountain building event which is what created what's known as the water pocket fold which is what made capital reef capital reef as far as the tectonics go. And they have this little model here that can push over and I can create a fold just like we see in Capitol Reef. So, so originally the layers were deposited horizontally and then there was a fault at depth that pushed up and created a fold in the Earth's surface. And that's what gives us Capitol Reef. Really cool to see this. Other things that helped create Capitol Reef was uh, faulting and this is kind of heavy oh I gotta be strong for this one but faulting and it's actually known as a reverse fault so you have one layer that stays low and one goes high and when it goes high it's coming up and it actually folds the layers up above right so it creates a it's another way to create one of these folds or one of these uplifts and that's actually what's happening at depth to create the fold we saw here also here is it shows what happens with erosion? So the other thing that's going on here and why it's so beautiful is we have a water eroding through the canyon here, which is creating these big steep cliffs we have. And in this case, it's known as a Fremont River that's coming through here. And we're going to travel along that on our way to some other stops. You can see how it can erode around and creates what we call a meander. But eventually it finds a weak or can find a weak zone in the rock and work its way underneath creating bridges. So Natural Bridges National Monument is exactly one of these if you ever get a chance to go check that park out. And the last thing I wanna show here is they actually talk about the volcanic action here. So there are a series of volcanoes that were in the area and we can actually see some of the dikes 
that are here in the park and we'll take a look at some of those later on in fact one wasn't too far away from the the entering capital reef national park sign but what happens is you have volcanic features come through the sedimentary layers through time and they can branch out as a dike if they're more vertical or a sill if they're more horizontal can continue to flow out and replace the rocks there and eventually as erosion takes place they're actually exposed at the surface like the one we can see in the picture here and we're going to go see in person pretty cool when we stopped at the visitor center we were able to look at some geologic models and one of them they showed was of a dike so the volcanic features coming through here what you can see is the red is the moenkopi the, the triassic formation and then you could see this black rock coming through so this is a volcanic dike coming through this section now there are volcanoes out here erupting about 20 million years ago and that's also where we get the black boulders we talked about before but this would have been purely intrusive in other words this wouldn't have been exposed at the surface until erosion exposed it from this angle you get a really nice view of that dike feature coming through creating this ridge because it's more resistant than the surrounding material so here's a map showing the greater capital reef area we are here at the visitor center and the sign we stopped at on our way in was somewhere in this area now what i want to point out is boulder mountain way over here and thousand lake mountain and you'll notice there's a bunch of uh, black colored features up there and that's actually the volcanics that eventually become these black boulders that come down into this area the other thing that you can see very nicely here is what's known as the water pocket fold or that layer might uplift that created a giant fold in the land. And you can really see that here where you can see these layers folding and bending over, which is really, really neat to see and pretty unique. Um, hence, they made a national park out of, this, out of this area. Now, because of erosion due to water and wind, it's actually carved a lot of this area out and really accentuated this and created this spectacular scenery that we see today. So from here, from the visitor center, we're gonna continue our way across and we're actually gonna go check out the Hickman Bridge hike over in this area. Just left the visitor center and what I wanna show you from the visitor center, which is located right here and if I pan to my left, you can actually see a number of the black boulders they were talking about sitting on top of the Moenkopi formation. The other thing that you can see here is that you can see the stripes in the rock. So the strata, we call that, or the layers. We can see they're not flat lying, they're actually dipping. And that's a function of being on this water pocket fold and because this layer might uplift. Really cool to see from just at the visitor center. I have arrived at possibly, actually positively, the most popular hike within Capitol Reef. So we're gonna take this hike talk about some of the sites along the way, talk about some of the geology along the way. This hike is known as the Hickman Bridge Trailhead and it's about 1.1 miles each way. So about two miles-ish, 2.2 miles round trip. So we'll go take a look at that and see what we can learn. Here's a map showing where we were at the visitor center. We drove along here past Fruita Schoolhouse. We'll stop and take a look at that another time. Petroglyph Panel all the way up here to Hickman Bridge. And now we're gonna do this hike, come through here come around and come back okay as we first start heading out on the trail we can see what's known as the Fremont River and this is the main river through this section and through Capitol Reef and what's really helped shape what we're seeing here in the cliff faces the other thing I want to point out here is a little bit about the geology and the stratigraphy and that is we're in what's known as the Wingate sandstone up here and then going we're going to go into the Kanta sandstone all the way if you can see in the background the white back there to the Navajo sandstone so as I start heading up Hickman Bridge Trail I want to make a slight correction I think I'm actually in the Kanta which sits right below the Navajo sandstone although there's a transition between the Wingate and Kanta I'm not exactly sure where that's at I think I'm now in that section and you get a beautiful view of what's known as Capitol Dome. So Capitol Dome is where Capitol Reef gets its name. The Capitol, because they have the Navajo Sandstone weathers, which I mentioned in the visitor center, and the reef part, because the water pocket fold was so hard to get across for the settlers and pioneers that they thought of it like a reef for a ship in the ocean that you can't get around or over. So hence the name Capitol Reef. All right, let's keep working our way up the trail. 
here's a nice view of the black boulder strewn fields. And these boulders again were transported here through a combination of glaciers and water. And those subsequent actions actually helped around them. Now these are an andesite and if I get up close to one, you can actually see the vesicules or the, the vesiculated nature of this or basically the air holes where the bubbles were coming out of the lava. So pretty cool to see that. It's hard not to stop about every three feet here and just take a look at the view because it is absolutely stunning. And there's very few places I've been that are as beautiful as this. Hence, this is one of my favorite, maybe my favorite national park right now. So as we're hiking up this trail, one thing that's interesting, there's a lot more going on as far as modern erosional processes here other than just the river. And so what we can see across the way is a large rock fall. And you can see that rock fall is made up of this lower portion of the Navajo sandstone that tumbled down there. So this gives you an idea of how do these canyons form and really gravity rules all. Okay, we've hiked up, I don't know, maybe a third of the way up so far. And I wanted to show this amazing view and talk again a little bit about the geology here. So again, the stuff on the horizon that we see all the way around is Navajo sandstone. The cliff former right below it is the Canta. If we get a little deeper in the canyon where it starts getting a little red down there, I think that's the top of the Wingate, which you saw at the visitor center. And the other thing you can see here as well is you can really see the regional dip associated associated with that Laramide uplift here where you can see everything gently dipping down towards the east. What a spectacular spot to be at. Okay, so one of the great things about sandstone is how beautiful it is in the cliff formers. The downside is it creates these sand piles or little mini sand dunes and sandy bottoms that you have to walk through, which is a lot of extra work. But the other th cool thing it can create are things like this bridge, which we saw an example of when we were at the visitor center. And this is a basically a mini version of Hickman Bridge down in this wash. And we can actually walk underneath this natural bridge and see where the water comes down when there's a flash flood or a lot of rain. It actually come down here in a waterfall and it's worked its way down and through this feature to create a bridge or a bit of a tunnel. You can see the size of this is about my height. So roughly a little bit less than six feet tall or a little less than two meters. But pretty neat to see a little mini junior Hickman bridge here. So we've worked our way out from down at the river, worked our way following this gulch and this dry riverbed. And we have our first glimpse of Hickman bridge here in the distance which is a much larger version of one of these bridges than what we just saw down in the riverbed. We'll continue our work our way over that way. And you can hear, it is a bit of a hike for anyone who does this. Wee, but it's well worth it. Please stay to the right. You are here, we're gonna go down, go under the bridge and loop back around. Here's Hickman Bridge. As we start approaching it, you can see we're gonna walk underneath. You can see where the people are for scale over there. It's quite an impressive structure. It probably stands Geez, close to 20 meters tall, 60 feet or so, I'm guessing. And then you can see it's carved out of what looks like a transition between the Canta on the bottom and the Navajo sandstone on top. So the actual bridge, I believe, is Navajo sandstone, but underneath it, you can see all these layers. And I think that's the easily or more easily erodible part, which is the Canta formation, which helped create this bridge. That is absolutely spectacular. So, as I read a little more information about this, or got my trusty sidekick here, Pete, thank you for helping me today, Pete. It's 37 meters tall or 125 feet. So even taller than I was guessing with those people. And I imagine it's because it goes around the corner there. That's pretty impressive. One of the most standout geologic features in Navajo sandstone is what's known as cross bedding. And you can see a nice example of that here where you have these these beds coming across and then they're cut by this cross cutting relationship. So these are, have to do with as the dunes were migrating they create these dipping or this dipping stratigraphy and they cut across one another so they have this cross cutting relationship or these these cross beds it's a nice example of that so across the goalie from me is the Navajo sandstone again and you can see the cross beds those 
dipping lines going across and they go different directions. And this is a classic type of bedding feature for ancient sand dunes. As I walk underneath this, I do want to film it. It is stunning. I cannot believe there's something this large free standing above me. And you can look how far down it is. This beautiful bridge, or like an arch, right? You think Arches National Park? Wow. Okay, let's keep hiking. Here's going underneath Hickman Bridge. And look, lo and behold, the backside of a bridge. Wow. I know this doesn't totally do it justice for scale, but you can see me here and you can see the size of this feature behind me. Definitely worth the hike up here. It is somewhere you want to bring water with you. So if you do come here, do bring some water. Grab the trail guide because there's some interesting stops along the way as well to learn about. And just take your time and enjoy the scenery and enjoy the views. All right. I know I still have a ways to go to get to the bottom of Hickman Trail, but I think this is a good spot to sign off because you can't beat this amazing view out here. And I want to leave you all with this picture. So what we're looking at is, what we're looking at is towards the water pocket fold. The main part of the water pocket fold is there in the background. And you can actually see part of Fruta down there with all the trees and Fremont River coming through where it's cut through time down through this section. And we can see the tilting of the different rock units over here in rock beds. Spectacular point. If you come here, take some time, enjoy it. It's awe-inspiring and breathtaking. And that's not just from the long hike uphill. All right, with that being said, let's go ahead and hike on down and go to our next stop. One of the most interesting geologic features that you can see and put your hand on right when you enter the the park is actually a fault and I'm standing right by it. Now the fault is directly across from where the Capitol Reef sign is. You can see this whitish unit on the one side and this red unit on the other. So this is the Chinle formation and this is the Moenkopi formation and there's a normal fault running right through this hillside here and that's why you see this difference of color. Now a normal fault means that this is younger than this and it's been dropped down relative to it. So the fault plane would go something like this and this side dropped down relative to this one. So a neat place to stop and look at some pretty unusual geology. It's not very often you get to go up and see a fault this close or be able to put your hand on it. Really cool. From this angle, you can really see what we call the strike or the direction of the fault coming through the hill here, coming down through the, fill, the hill here and continuing on where you can see a, a distinct difference between the white and the red. It's a nice place to come see a fault if you've never seen one. One of the more interesting cultural sites that are here is there's actually a wall with petroglyphs on it from the ancient Fremont people, which were the ancestors of the Hopi, the Pueblo, and the Paiute tribe. And as you can imagine, having the Fremont River here, all this lush vegetation, probably lots of game, became a place where the ancient and indi indigenous people could thrive. What's neat is they left a record of their culture here in a way of having these petroglyphs up here. And we'll go take a closer look at it. And here is a closer look, at least on a picture on a board. So signs of a thriving people. And you can see the petroglyphs that are on the walls here. And this marker talks about how long the ancestral, the ancestors of the Hopi, the Pueblo Zuni and the Paiute lived here. They were here for about 300 to 1300, sort of a thousand years. The Fremont culture existed in this canyon and made this home. From this vantage point, you can see the Wingate Sandstone, which is where the Fremont people carved their petroglyphs on. And you notice that there's a patina, what we call a patina or desert varnish. So that allowed the indigenous people to carve off that patina or that darker layer to get to, to expose the lighter layer underneath it, which is why we can see those distinct differences 
where they actually carved their petroglyphs. So that's what makes the petroglyphs stand out basically. And the reason we don't see petroglyphs everywhere was probably a combination of access. So you can imagine that there's probably been some erosion. It was probably easier to access those. Today it'd be very hard to get up to that ridge into that area. And there had to be an area where you had some kind of patina that the indigenous people could carve through or chip away at. So you can see that contrast from the underlying layer of the rock. So a little bit of a tie between the geology and the petroglyphs here. There are two directions you can go to visit the petroglyphs. We went to the first one, which is a very short walk. Um, maybe 100 feet, 20 to 30 meters. And then there's a longer walk, and I'm not sure how long this one's gonna be, but they have this nice pathway, and it goes over some of the swamp area, and you actually see there's flowers coming out. So we're here uh, in July. Actually, today is the 4th of July. Happy 4th of July, everybody. And the flowers are just starting to come out in some of these areas. It's still been pretty chilly here. Definitely jacket weather in the mornings and evenings. As we approach the end of this walkway, we're going to see some more petroglyphs. They do have this sign about farming the Fremont River, and it talks about the Fremont indigenous culture here and the tools they used, and then the early Mormon settlers. We're going to talk a little bit about the early Mormon settlers here and about the town of Fruta after this stop but this was a very fertile valley and has been for a long time there's been water coming through here and actually we can see evidence of water throughout a long period of time and where can i see that if i look at the cliff face across from me we have what's the bottom part of what is known as a chinle formation and then we start getting into the wingate formation here but what's on top of that are a bunch of rounded boulders. We saw these black boulders along the Hickman Trail as well. And what that's recording is water motion. And in this case, we can actually see there's a little gravel bar at the end. And how do we get gravel bars? We get them by rivers. So this tells me by looking at this cliff face that the river once upon a time used to be all the way up there and it's eroded down to the point it's at today. So water has been coming through this canyon for a very long time now how long that is i don't know what that that distance or the erosion rates are here but i can look at this for clues that indeed the fremont river was flowing and we can see that evidence on the cliff face across the way from me so as i head out let's talk a little bit about the town of fruta we're going to go check out the schoolhouse that was built in 1896 and the town of Fruta was actually set up in this valley for much the same reasons that the Fremont culture set up here because the abundance of water and the ability to grow things here. So the town of Fruta was originally known as Junction and then Eden, I believe. It was set up in 1880 and I was never able to find out what the population of the town was. So if anybody watching this has that information, please share it down below in the comments. I know the schoolhouse that I read about had not very many students and we'll go learn a little bit more about that in our next stop schools in session welcome to the fruta schoolhouse established in 1896 and really the center of culture for the fruta community this served as the church building this served as a community hall where they would have dances or social gatherings in and of course it served as a school which had up to 26 students at one time However, through the years, as in most communities like this, the population grew for a while and then declined until actually in the 1950s, Fruta was not a town anymore. But the schoolhouse remains, so we can peek in some of the windows here and take a look. Having 26 students in this building. Now, it's not open right now, unfortunately. But you can get an idea about the size. I'll get rid of do, reduce the glare there. The chalkboard up there. There's a, a, a stove pipe in the middle to keep the classroom warm for the students. You can see the little chalk tablet to practice writing. Their book to practice reading. And the size of their desks. Because the school's not open, here's a nice look inside. I tried to get 
a view through the windows, but the glare was pretty bad. But here you can see, again, the chalkboards, the heater in the middle, so so the, the wood heater, so the students would stay warm throughout the winter, and then the chalkboard for writing. Not a very big building to fit 26 students plus the teacher, but so important and the backbone of this entire community. And speaking of backbones of a community, one of the reasons Fruta is here and it's called Fruta is because of the number of orchards that were set up. And here you can see some of the apricot trees and they're just coming into time to start picking them, I believe. So they're still just maybe a little bit green, but you can actually come here, visit the visitor center, ask them about coming and collecting the fruit here. So they have, I believe, peach and apricot and even maybe apples here. And you can come during different times of year and pick your own fruit, which is quite a fun activity. And I've done it with my family. Here's a little bit more about those orchards that the Mormon pioneers planted in the Fertile Valley here from the 1880s to the 1960s. And of course they had a whole series of things, apples, apricots, cherries, peaches, pears, and plums dotted the family orchards. And there's a series of these orchards across the entire valley as you drive, or, drive around this area. And it is worth stopping and learning about this part. Now it does have orchard regulations. I mentioned you can, you can pick fruit uh, here. You can have your dog on a leash. We've brought our dog with us before. And you can see the hours. Uh, fence orchard hours are nine to five. Unfenced orchards are dawn to dusk. So that's where I'm at right now is an unfenced fenced orchard. So you can come here and pick your own fruit from these trees if it's ripe. It's not quite ripe yet. Probably another week or so would be perfect. There are other sites here to visit for the fruit of town, including a blacksmith shop and some houses. Between the visitor center and the campground, you can come visit the blacksmith shop that's part of the Fruto community here. And they have an old tractor in here. Uh, you can see the anvil and uh, the furnace and get an idea of what working out here would have been like for maintaining the equipment, the farm equipment that they had to use for both orchards as well as other fruits and vegetables they grew out here and you have a nice view of another one of the big orchards over here and this is one of the big orchards that I've gone into and picked apricots before uh, right over here but it looks like it's closed it's pretty early in the morning so I think they open up at nine and right now it's closed but they also have another little center here where we've come to programs before and I don't know if that's closed permanently or if they'll eventually come back there's a lot of history to learn about here, about Fruta and the early Mormon settlers and the community that grew up around here. And they have a number of buildings to visit. I've already shown the schoolhouse, I showed the blacksmith shop. But you can also come here and take a tour of the Gifford House Museum and store. Um, it's open from 9 to 4.30. Unfortunately, it's not open while I'm here right now. But you can come here and take a tour of this home and get an idea of how some of the pioneers lived. Thank you all for joining me to explore Capitol Reef National Park. I hope you enjoyed learning about the geology and the historic sites at this amazing natural wonder. It's probably one of the least visited national parks, which is also one of the things I really enjoy. Even on Hickman Trail, uh, Fourth of July weekend, there are very few people that we ran across going back and forth along the most popular trail here. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this channel and make sure to hit that bell for notifications so you can keep up on all our adventures. I really appreciate all of you joining me today. I hope you learned a lot. I sure did. I look forward to seeing you in my next episode and take care. Far one of my favorite signs I've ever seen, <laughs> Marmot Crossing. <laughs>